make sure that you have, uh, have one here so that you can take it home after uh, the, the uh, services are over during the Advent season. And the Christmas angel tree is set up out there, and you came in. Um, it seems to me, as I told you before, it ought to be about the end of July. This year has just flown by, and I have not really had, had really got a handle on it. Someone said that that's not what Kevin said as being an old, a year older this year because they didn't use this year.
be seated. It's always wonderful to have uh, Julie here. She has a long relationship with the chapel. She's played uh, for us here several times, and it's always a delight. Julie, thank you very much for today. We're also happy to have today Reverend Nancy Summerlin. You can read her bio there in your bulletin. She has uh, uh, been uh, a Presbyterian minister. Actually, she told me this morning that she, she's a whole lot like the chapel in that she started out life as a Baptist, in college, she became an Episcopalian, went to the seminary, became a Presbyterian. She is covering all the bases when she gets to heaven. So uh, at, we are happy to have her. She retired. She has uh, served in uh, several churches as both full-time and as interim, even in Mexico. And so it's wonderful. And she continues to serve there in her uh, religious organization there in uh, Virginia. We're happy to have Nancy. This is her first time here today. And so we're glad to have Nancy. The service is yours. Good morning. It is so good to be here. <laughs> uh, let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, so that by hearing we may also obey your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Gospel lesson is from Matthew, the fifth chapter. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your Father, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. T.S. Eliot wrote, The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The place I started was a mill town in central Virginia. Logging operations for miles around brought timber to the big mill to be cut. And smaller factories turned waste products into paper, turpentine, and handles for tools. We had a tannery and the world's largest clothespin factory, if anybody here remembers clothespins. Nearly everyone in town was supported by the mill one way or another, including a group of Italian immigrants who had brought with them the Roman Catholic Church. They had their own school, even their own hospital. On Sundays after worship, when the Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterians ate fried chicken with mashed potatoes and thick yellow gravy at the fountain section of Jurgen's Drugstore, the Catholics were at a restaurant down the street eating spaghetti and big meatballs with tomato sauce, and the word was, they were drinking wine. <laughs> we weren't allowed to go near that restaurant, not ever, don't even think about it. There was something mysterious, almost dangerous, about these people I had little occasion to meet, even in a small town. And my father gave me dire predictions of what would happen if I ever married one of those Catholic boys, which made them all the more interesting. <laughs> It was in the context of this great cultural and religious divide that I often wondered why, each Sunday, we would stand up in worship and say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Since children at an early age begin to notice and accept that the church is a great place for inconsistencies, I didn't ask why. But I was aware that some people refused to say that part of the Apostles' Creed, just like they wouldn't say Jesus descended into hell. Apparently, they didn't believe in the Holy Catholic Church. And if we care at all about what comes out of our mouths during worship, if saying or singing that we believe in something means we are actively part of it, you have to admit, this is a bold and challenging claim to make. Now, the word Catholic is not in the Bible. It's made up of two Greek words, kata, which means concerning, and holos, which means the whole thing. And from that comes our understanding of Catholic with a lowercase c, as the universal church made up of all Christian churches in different times and places with different doctrines, different polity, even different theologies, but united by the teaching of the apostles and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Today's New Testament lesson, although addressed to the church in Ephesus, 
is considered by scholars to be a letter more likely written to the whole church in general than to a particular congregation. And in it, the focus is on unity. God's foreordained plan for salvation that includes bringing Jews and Gentiles together in a community empowered by the love that was demonstrated by Jesus Christ. In today's reading, we discover what virtues are required in order to lead a life worthy of our calling as members of this church. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain the bond of peace given to us by the Spirit. It sounds so sweet, almost easy, until something happens. The preacher chooses a hymn nobody knows or likes. Now that'll get people started, believe me. Somebody suggests another time for the church board to meet, and the worship committee tries to change the Christmas Eve service, and everybody has an opinion. So much for peace and unity. To be fair, the idea of all this motley crew of humanity with assorted experiences and values being drawn together through the life and teaching, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was and still is a mystery that goes against the very grain of our human nature. Because let's face it, we have a real talent for creating differences. Cultural, geographic, economic, race, age, gender, food, even fashion, you name it, we can make an issue out of it. All of these divisive, divisive issues and more have found their way into the church at one time or another, even when they had little to do with God and almost everything to do with our preferences and personal agendas. But in the history of Christianity, there also have been some powerful theological issues that divided people, beginning with circumcision. We don't talk about it today the way Paul did because it's just not a big deal. It's an optional procedure for infant boys in the hospital. But this was of great importance to the early church whose very survival depended on a faithful resolution. Must Gentiles embrace and even submit to circumcision in order to become professed believers in Jesus Christ? Or would Jesus' fellow Jews be required to give up God's covenant with Abram practiced for thousands of years and clearly prescribed in sacred writings that are now part of our Old Testament, must they give that up in order to be one with these Gentile strangers? Eventually, they worked it out. But the writer of Ephesians recognized the tension that was inevitable between the need for unity and the simple fact of diversity. From the beginning, there were different gifts. Some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, and differences remain. There are people who feed and shelter the homeless and those who polish silver and prepare communion. People who knit caps for babies in foreign missions and folks who wade up to their knees in mud and muck during relief efforts. Excuse me, I lost page here. <laughs> um, there are people who show up for work days and shut-ins who write notes, make phone calls, and send cards. 
intrepid choir members, faithful church school teachers, and those we see at Christmas and Easter, people who help with youth groups and others who keep vigils beside hospital beds, elders and deacons who lead, and sweet faces that quietly encourage from the back pew. And I'm here to tell you, no preacher ever gets through a sermon without those faces. All of these and more are the church. We come from different backgrounds, different parts of the country, even the world, reading different translations of the Bible, bringing different hurts and wounds, different hopes and expectations, different tastes in music and worship, different denominational experiences, different languages and memories, different understandings of what is truth and what it means to be tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. By the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, differences that seem insurmountable can be reconciled. When my son was ready for kindergarten, I enrolled him in the best school in West Virginia. It happened to be at a nearby convent run by a teaching order of Roman Catholic nuns. I still remember the day I dropped him off to spend a week with his grandparents while I was away on business. As I walked out the door, I saw my father in the living room, the ordained Baptist deacon who had such strong opinions about Catholicism when I was young, with his Episcopalian grandson in his lap, giving the boy the questions from the Catholic Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> My father had grown in his understanding and acceptance of different ways to worship God, not because he read a book or was influenced by a sermon. It happened because he loved us, both of us. Years later, after leaving corporate America to attend seminary when I was 58, my first call was to a small Presbyterian church outside West Point, Virginia, a small town supported by a big paper mill, very much like the place where I started. Except it was Polish immigrants who brought the Roman Catholic Church to West Point. And Marie's was the restaurant where at one time good Protestants wouldn't go, not ever, don't even think about it. But today, each Thursday, when the special is fried chicken, there is a table of Presbyterians at Marie's having more fun than God's frozen chosen should ever have in public. Some of them who heard the same advice from their parents that I did married those Catholic boys and girls anyhow so that today there are members and elders with last names like Moskalski, Kozlowski, and Waxmunsky and down the street at Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament where parents also cautioned against interfaith marriages there are solid Anglican names on their rolls. It wasn't Vatican II or a violent uprising that reconciled these old separations taken for granted for so long, friends. It was accomplished by love. We find what holds us together by bearing one another in love. We build up the church by speaking the truth in love. And we do it because the church doesn't belong to us, it belongs to Christ. It's the body of Christ. And in it and through it, we must, must love each other even in our differences because Jesus said so. 
not a recommendation or a suggestion, but a commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And the one another includes people we don't know or like, people who are different and don't agree with us, sometimes people who are just too mean to love. What was he thinking? The Jesus who knows us so well and loves us so much anticipated how diff difficult this would be when he prayed in John's Gospel, Father, protect them that they might be one so the world may believe you have sent me. It's that simple. Only when we love each other and love even strangers and enemies, only then can we know how truly remarkable it is that God loves us. Because in the presence of divinity, none of us is all that cute and cuddly. And yet God loves us and calls us to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. Outside, divisive rhetoric may swirl around us, causing us to explore once again what it means to be followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. We can have the experience but miss the meaning by arriving where we started, bringing with us divisions old and new. Or we can know the place for the first time, captured by all that binds us. One Lord, one Spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all of us and through all of us and in all of us, drawing us together in divine love and then sending us out so the world will know and believe Jesus was here and still is here. May it be so. May it always be so. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us sing together. Blessed be the time. go in peace to love and serve the Lord, remembering that that means loving and serving all God's children. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forever. Amen.
is on a chair in that office. Right? Okay. Going on your right. Okay. Thank you. So and I'm taking you. And I, you told me where to, where to just call Allison okay. somehow. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah.